Ibn Qutta did not understand uh, many things. I, I found, I, I, I was critical of what MP Malema, Malema said there, but the short answer that MP Malema gave was that our people means blacks in general and Africans in particular. To my knowledge, the President of this Republic has never corrected MP Malema and it has become common usage for our people, either in the President's mouth or in other people's mouth, not to refer to all of our people as South Africans. And I had an hour, I, I did an extensive interview with MP the Court of Office. To go back one step, uh, when Julius Malema calls people land thieves, um, it is my general, but I would say expert understanding that he is not referring to people who illegally invade land or have illegally invaded land in the last few years. Rather, he is referring to people, and if he was doing that, it would just be a, a categorical legal description. Uh, rather, he is referring to people on the basis of their race. That if, a, if that white South Africans in general, as a general proposition, do not deserve the property that they have uh, because apartheid was a wicked system. Now, my submission is that apartheid was a wicked and unjust system, but that the inference can't be drawn that white people are all land thieves. Um, but what I'm trying to say in this sentence is that those two aspects of political speech, and there are many others that I'm just highlighting, that what that does is because it comes from figures of authority, and the polling from the Institute of Race Relations shows that presently 60% of South Africans, roughly 60% of South Africans, approve of President Ramaphosa. And at the time, his approval rating was even stronger. And there is very strong approval for, for, for Julius Malema, millions of South Africans. I can't say off the top of my head, but I think it was something like 20% of South Africans approve of him. When people are so strongly approved of, say these things, and I'm arguing that these things are stigmatizing. If you accept that premise, and you accept that they're coming from figures of authority, the effect of that must be that ordinary South Africans are then more likely to also stigmatize um, white South Africans. Now, I, I must qualify this by saying, it is not my opinion that most South Africans think this way. It is a key point that I raise whenever people don't shut me up, that 80% of South Africans on our surveys come up consistently as common sense, decent people who, who share what I would describe as the core values of the Institute of Race Relations, especially with regards to race and, 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 the, and the moral good of non race I can ask you to read that, I'll read the last sentence here, which is, most of all, a target is put on all property owners' backs by the expropriation bill and Parliament's efforts to shred the Bill of Rights. Could you explain what is meant by that? By way of background, the first project I worked on at the Institute of Race Relations, in fact, the way that I got a job there, because it's a difficult place to get a job, was that I'd read a book uh, by this kind of, some of this country's top academics about land reform. And I found a case study there in Ekutuleni, which is in the eastern part of KZN, uh, sort of 180 by Melbourne. <coughs> anyway, in that event, uh, I found some discrepancies and I wanted to research it myself, so the Institute funded me to do so. What I found there were uh, two Zulu families a pastor, Charles Tomano, and the Nyandus. Walter and William Nyandu were elder gentlemen and they had families. And they were burnt out of their house and home. Uh, since I'm in a court, I should say allegedly. But the evidence that I was presented with was, uh, I would say, left no room for doubt as to what happened there. They were effectively expropriated without compensation. And I spoke to them years after they had been in hiding, and the elder young brother, who had become the chief of that CPO, had died in hiding. Now, what I found in that case was, amongst other things, 
because the idea of property rights had been so undermined in public opinion, it was taking no effect in practice. So the younger and younger brother, as an elder gentleman in his seventies, showed me the, his title deed, weeping, because they had been fighting their whole lives for that title deed. And by the time they received it, it had no meaning in their lives. They could not be returned. The mayor of Melbourne had come, nothing happened. They were still stuck in hiding. That it had become a parchment uh, barrier, as the American founding fathers would say, something paper thin with no effect. Now, my interpretation of that case, and there were others, David Rakhaisi was a case, which the Institute played a large role in amplifying, was that South Africans that are black, South Africans that are white, Indian colored, South Africans who own things, regardless of how they look, are in a more dangerous position. They have less recourse to accountability because of this rhetoric that undermines the thought that property sometimes is owned by an individual and that it is the people's duty to then protect that individual from theft. And that the way that this should happen is that the government should protect them from being robbed. Instead, the idea being out is that the government should do the robbing. And, and that sentence is trying to say that insofar as that idea is put out there, it, it puts a greater risk uh, to, to South Africans regardless of their race. My learned friend had put to you that that sentence shows that you only care about the property rights of whites and white farmers. How would you respond to that? I reject that assertion. I, I think it's important to note that the Institute of Race Relations has a history of fighting for property rights for, for, for black South Africans in particular. And that it is our view that the best chance for all poor South Africans, most of whom are black, uh, to enjoy a better material existence is through a strengthening of property rights. That is a huge part of our motivation to argue this. It is not just an abstract principle. It, it is bread and butter <coughs> for millions of South Africans. If I can ask you, um you were asked by my learned friend about why in your uh, expert report you don't mention this uh, vigilante group where video was shown. Were you present in Senegal when that vigilante group attacked the court? No, I was not present. Uh, in a way, I wish I had been because I think it was interesting and important. But uh, I, I have not been... In, in fact, yeah... The short answer is not, I was, I was not present and uh, I don't think anyone expected that incident to blow up in the way that it did. So it, was, it would have been difficult for me to anticipate it to go there and report it uh, in person. Uh, part of the way you can tell it was a surprise is that the police were caught by surprise. How many days after that incident were you in Senegal? Depending on how you count, I, I would say nine days. In other words, it happened on the 6th, I arrived on the 15th. And then do your articles deal with things that you personally witnessed to? My articles deal with two things predominantly. That which I was per personally witnessed to, and the aspects uh, around Brennan Horner's murder, particularly in relation to the, uh, well, Aspects particularly relating to, to Brennan Porter's murder. If I can ask you about the, this billboard we've shown to you of racism is not the problem, can you tell us a bit about that campaign? Yes, thank you. Racism was the problem. It, 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 that is to say, for since the Union of South Africa, Almost any issue could be traced back to racism. So if you ask yourself the question, why are literacy levels in the trans sky so low? The answer had to include, it would, you would go to a particular school and a teacher and a headmaster and a funding question, you could go up the causal chain 
But at the top of that causal chain, you would find uh, a legal system that was fundamentally racist. And, and because of my view of the law and how important the law is, I, my analysis is that you really can trace so many of those problems back. Not every single problem in the country could be traced back to that. I'm sure someone fell over and bumped their knee, and then that was a problem for them, and it had nothing to do with racism. But in, as a serious general proposition, it all traced, it almost all traced back. It's my view that things have changed. Uh, it's my view, sympathetically, that that the phrase generals tend to fight the last war is an apt phrase. Circumstances can change faster than our thinking. And at a think tank, maybe some way that we can help is by bridging that gap, is by updating our thinking to the reality today. Now, how do we find this out? We don't uh, merely close our eyes and contemplate the back of our eyelids to evaluate how bad or how good or how important is racism in South Africa today. We do demographically representative, statistically significant uh, surveys. In fact, we don't do them ourselves because it is not our expertise. We hire independent companies to do them, and we have hired several different companies to do them. And the results more or less always come out the same. Here are three of the most surprising results. More or less 80% of South Africans say that they have not personally experienced any form of racism in the last five years. That's not good enough, but that is encouraging, and it is very surprising. I think that good news does not necessarily create complacency. If you tell people we're winning this battle, it can encourage people to try even harder rather than to become a resigned. The second fact, just to choose three, is that when we ask people, either from an open list, to name what are the biggest issues of the day, less than 5% say racism. And if we give a closed list, less than 5% say racism. So the supermajority are seeing bigger issues. We also see, and this is a surprising result, if we ask people, how would you like jobs to be appointed? And we give four options. Only black people should get jobs for a long time ahead. Or only black people should get jobs until demographic representativity is achieved. Or by merit with uh, uh, special educational opportunities for the genuinely disadvantaged. Or by merit alone. 80% to choose one of those two merit options, and only 20% choose the race-based options. So those are three figures. 80% of people are, are saying yes to merit. Uh, by the way, 80% of South Africans more or less say yes, they would prefer a voucher-based system for education, healthcare, and housing to be EE. So that's very different to where our politics is, but it's where the ordinary South African is. And we try to bring the message that ordinary South Africans are not obsessed with race. They don't look at people who are the same and think they are automatically their friends. They don't look at people who are different and automatically think they are enemies. Ordinary South Africans are much more sophisticated than our politics would, would lead you to be. The, the last thing to say about that campaign is probably that in my mind, it was inspired by, um, by a book I read called The Honor Code, How Moral Revolutions Happen, by Kwame Anthony Appiah, who was a professor of mine at Princeton University and is now at New York University. And I think it's fair to say he's one of the world's leading experts in race relations. He literally wrote the textbook at and in the, text, in, the, in the book, How Moral Revolutions Happens, he identifies certain, certain aspects, a way that if you break a taboo, it can unlock a huge amount of change without violence. 
And he refers to the abolitionist movement in the United Kingdom, starting in Manchester in uh, the early 1800s, where there was a group called the Friends, and it is from this that I suggested that our newspaper be called the Daily Friend, where people who wanted to end slavery formed think tanks. They were Quakers, so they were religious, but they didn't talk very much about their religion. They were formed think tanks, they would try and write articles in newspapers, they would try and go around and speak to the community as we have done, and bring people together and say this thing is wrong. And there were certain techniques that they used that we have tried to use, and, and one of my beliefs is that if it could be normal in South Africa to say racism is not the problem, then we solve various issues. One thing is, when it is a problem, in a particular instance, you can say this time racism is the problem, and this time racism is not the problem. We must see both of those options. If we can do that, we will open our minds to the need for evidence before judgment. As a second matter and as a broader political matter, if we can make it normal to say racism is not the problem, that it is made out to be, we can make it easier for people to say, what is the solution to the biggest problem that we have? And the biggest problem we have, according to my South Africans, is unemployment. And we at the Institute believe we have the answer to that problem in the form of our non-racial program. Vouchers for education, so people, parents have choices. Uh, uh, property rights that are protected so that investment returns and jobs can grow, and so on down the line. But if you want to know more about how the IRL thinks we can you know, save South Africa, I will refer you to our literature. But, but that was the basic idea, was to try and, try and pop this bubble that you can't ever say that. Or if you do say it, you deliberately misinterpret it, that it is taboo. In order to have a moral revolution, you have to remove some taboos. And that was what I hoped to do, and what I continue to hope to do. My learned friend referred you to an extract of Mr. Ritz's book where he talks about, through the lens of Twitter and Facebook, it would appear to be the case that racism is, uh, that we have a scourge of racism. A major crisis of the human race. Yes. Is there, is there a difference between our perception created by social media and the reality on the ground? That is correct. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that sometimes, as people, we don't respect that. We, we can get carried away by the likes and the fanfare. But one of the privileges of my job is to go into rural South Africa, go into the CBD. I used to live very close by here, just walk the streets and talk to people and find very different attitudes. Even as I said, to find very different attitudes at BFF rallies. Sometimes what is being said on the stage can be very different to what's being Sometimes. If I can ask you, you were referred to an article um, which has the hashtag Black Lives Matter. Is there a difference between that phrase and the uh, Black Lives Matter organization? Yes. The, 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 there were two organizations that we drew reference to in the in the report. The main one uh, started around 2013 and became the runner-up time person of the year uh, somewhere around 2016. Uh, founded chapter houses across America, eventually founded chapter houses around the world. It was a very serious organization. Its tax headquarters was in Delaware, where you pay the lowest taxes in America. And they managed to raise millions and millions of dollars. Um, and I respect that. As I said, we, I believe institutional civic activism is very important. Uh, and the fact that they managed to raise so much money and so much credibility or esteem strikes me as admirable and something to think about. And that is different to the phrase. And in a sense, it's different to the movement. Because there were people who were part of the movement. 
uh, who were not part of the nation. And there are yet again people who might use the phrase who are neither part of the movement nor are they making money out of the network or donating money into the network. Do you endorse the phrase that black people's lives matter? Unequivocally. Yes. What concerns do you have about uh, the movement? I, I think in cross-examination, one of my concerns was highlighted, which is that I think that the movement might be proposing the wrong solution. But before that, and what I didn't get a chance to mention, is that I think it's got the wrong diagnosis of the problem. So, in the report I went through quite extensively, uh, firstly, a sort of more popular opinion piece by Coleman Hughes, who is, uh, in my opinion, the greatest American writer that's younger than me. Uh, he's a very young man, but he's a very excellent writer. Um, and he finds himself in a difficult position because he's black, he's often pigeonholed. Uh, and he has worked his way out of that pigeonhole. His analysis of the BLM movement, in short, was that his misdiagnosis was as follows. America has a policing problem. Too many people are being killed by the police unjustly. But those people can be black or they can be white. And as long as it's, the issue is racialized, so that the only protest against police abuse is in the name of black victims, then there is a backlash against that because it's factually wrong that only black people are victims. And that backlash, in effect, protects corruption within the police. So he went in a non-racial opposition to American police abuse. He believed that would be more effective. I then dug deeper into Professor Roland Fry, who was the first black PhD professor at Harvard University and a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. And who, I'm mentioning his race because he mentions his race in his analysis did a statistical analysis of, um, of police shootings and of, of contact between police and, and civilians. And that could range. He had a scale, I think, from one to five. From just touching someone on the shoulder to handcuffing them, to forcing them onto the ground, to uh, putting a taser to them, uh, to shooting. And what, and what Roland Fry found um, was no evidence of, of discrimination when it came to police shooting or police killing. In fact, he found that police were less likely to shoot a, a black uh, person if you go on the basis, not of the population, but of the proportion of encounters than a white person. And he speculated that some of that might be because of uh, certain concerns. Now, Sorry, am I going on to go to Mr. Kapsibota? Your Lordship, I must apologize. The point of re examination is first not to introduce new evidence. New evidence is being led. Secondly, the answers are so long winded we can't keep track of what the answer is. Can I ask that the questions be directed, answered on the parameters of the question so that we can get a move on? It's already late in the day. As the court pleases. Thank you. Mr. Um, my Lord, I do intend on finishing re-examination today, and I don't intend on being much longer. Um, I, you know, this article was, was shown uh, to the witness, um, and questions are put to the witness, and you must be given an opportunity to respond to the implications of that. Yes, but the witness does actually tread outside evidence that has, was covered in chief and evidence that was covered in cross-examination. 
I think you need to guide the witness also. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> if I return to the, the question was, uh, what concerns do you have about the movement? Yes, and, and sorry, I was just trying to draw reference to, to things that are in the report. Uh, in brief, I think they misdiagnosed the problem of police killings in America. And I quote several studies, uh, academic studies, as well as an opinion piece in that regard. I think that they will broadly misdiagnose the problem of racism in America. Uh, and in that regard, I get into some of the academic literature, as well as some of uh, my own inferences. And uh, uh, in the third instance, they propose the wrong solutions. The solutions that they propose exacerbate inequalities increase discretionary administration, which in my opinion undermines freedom or undermines the credibility of those government institutions which we need to be trusted. And in the final instance, I think that there may be, in some cases, nefarious motives uh, and we give some reason to uh, to contemplate that, not with regards to the movement in general. So, Mr. Oppenheimer, I think I've got to come in here. Look, as I understand this case, it's about hate speech. Now, witness earlier on, remember, we kind of engaged in a of the cuff debate about liberalism and. Uh, the critical school of thoughts. And, and I thought maybe what we need to focus on is if you look at the critical school of, uh, legal school of thought, they actually touch on the American freedom of speech. A and they do say that <clears throat> the American approach to freedom of speech is much more liberal. And, and the critical school of thought says that's where the problem is. And they deal also with this issue about racism that manifests itself sometimes in the media, sometimes in all those things. Now, I understand that when you deal with racism, you're dealing with a broader concept that would overlap even into the issues about the police shootings and all those. But here, the focus has to be on the speech. And, 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 and if you look at the American Constitution, I think we a little bit we're different in the approach. And, and I think when you read those critical legal scholars, you will see that uh, they, they, they preach that there should be less interference by the state. So there'd be less legislation. Here we're talking about the state that has now intervened and has now legislated. And what brings us here, it's because of that legislation. So I, I would urge that maybe we should I understand the issues that you're trying to address, but maybe let's hone in on what's before us. Freedom of speech and the question of hate speech. Yes, my lord. My lord, I, I asked the, the last question I want to ask is in relation to, if I understand um, what my learned friend has done, is to raise questions about the nature of the Institute or the nature of Mr. Krause's other writings uh, in an effort to uh, attack his evidence. In other words, to say, well, we have ideological concerns with what you've written. So I want to just provide him with an opportunity to respond okay. to those types of criticisms. Um, okay. To my mind, of course, this case is about hate speech and is a narrow question. And you know, the, the critiques about the Institute for Race Relations are not pertinent to that question. But given that they were put to the witness, I just want to provide him with an opportunity okay. to respond. That's fine. I'm just saying let's narrow down and, and uh, guide the witness. Yes. Um, Then, then the last question I'm going to ask is about that letter that my learned friend read out to you. In other words, people who were past members of the Institute of Race Relations, some who say they were current members, um, who wrote this, uh, this, this concerned letter about the Institute. Do you have any reflections on that letter? 
Uh, yes, and I'm trying to keep it brief on what, uh, because I understand that this, the IRR is not in fact on trial. Um, uh, as I referenced earlier, in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a very serious debate that brewed within the Institute about, in the first instance, whether it should continue to exist after the defeat of apartheid, and in the second instance, how it should exist if it does. A large proportion of the IRR, although I would not say a majority, a large proportion, including some very respectable people, wanted the IRR to be very close to the ANC. I think this may have been very prudent. It was clear that the ANC was going to be in charge for a long time. And if you have the King's Gear or the Queen's Gear, you can have great influence as a lobby, as a lobby group. And in fact, we have uh, had various ANC presidents in our corridors taking our briefings, and we value that opportunity. We still have an open door to anyone, <coughs> including uh, the, the respondents, because we think we've got the formula for success. But there was a disagreement about how that relationship should work. And ultimately, the side that held the day insisted on a, on a very strict uh, separation. And when I say very strict, I mean that that included quite strident criticism of certain ANC policies from the very beginning. And some of that is mentioned in other uh, documents that have been brought up and discovered. So I won't get into it. But since then, there was a strong sense of dissatisfaction <coughs> amongst those who left. And if you go through the list, I would just factually dispute the initial claim which was read out to me that current members of the IRR were involved in the writing of that letter. If such a current member can be identified, uh, it would be news to me. And I have read the letter many times. Most of the members, those dates are identified, they left a long time ago and were disgruntled having left. And they were unpleased with John Kane Berman, who was our leader, our CEO, and they were unpleased with Dr. Franz Brunier. And then a new CEO came along, Dr. John Endress, who was not very well known. And in my opinion, they saw an opportunity to level a public criticism that would change the direction of the IRR back to the track that they would have preferred in the 1980s and early 1990s. In my opinion, this is exactly the time not to do that. We must remain as critical, if not more critical, in the face of such measures as the Expropriation Bill, the Employment Equity Amendment Act, the State of Disaster and Coronavirus Command Council. These are all things that I campaign against, uh, where I have tens, tens of thousands of people who have signed petitions to endorse my campaigns, to end the Command Council, for example, or to oppose the Employment Equity Bill. I went to Parliament to argue against the alteration of the Constitution. That kind of stuff must go on for us. And we feel that our critics are not on the same page as our environment. And so there is a political disagreement, and I respect that. What I don't respect is the aspersions that they cast on us, uh, in some instances that are unfair. Um, but I don't, I think, after what my Lord said, it's probably not right for me to go line by line and fish out sentences where I can demonstrate untruths that they have ushered at us. But if you'd like me to do that, uh, I can go ahead and do that. Could you give us uh, an example or two? So, if we go up a little bit, maybe this will be spoken. Off the top of my head, they said uh, that after 30 people had, they spoke about our, our, our attempt to block the Firearm Control Act Amendment Bill, and I had led that campaign. Uh, they described this as being motivated by, I don't want to put the wrong words in their mouth now that I'm accusing them of putting the wrong words in my mouth, so I really would prefer if I could just uh, get a direct reference. They say just after 30 people have been shot. I mean, 
mean, I can stop here, but just if you see over there, it says, IROC fosters a, a free market small state agenda while representing itself as a human rights research organization devoted to impartial fact based analysis. Firstly, this is presented as if it's inimical uh, when it's not. Secondly, we are not a small state institution, we are a limited state institution. Now, I think every it is our position that the state should be limited. We disagree on how small it should be. I, for example, think it should be larger than some of my colleagues. This is a, a minor misrepresentation. Um, the, the guns thing is more major, but uh, is it there? If I recall, the claim was that um, that you opposed gun reform legislation in the face of 30 people being shot after the, the July riots. So that, that's the, the nature of the allegation. Sorry, ma'am. Maybe, maybe you should go to view and enlarge the document even further. If you go to view, you'll see there's a plus there. Just press the plus. Oh, no, you've gone the other way. Apparently it's 1812, the fourth paragraph. Yeah, and I think you just can also do the elite where they say we follow the elite agenda. Okay, so... So... Having, having led this campaign myself, it, it, in the second sentence it says, it equates gun rights with self-defense and personal property rights despite the constitutional court having ruled that gun ownership is a privilege and not a right. At all stages in our campaign, we emphasized that no one should be able to own a gun unless they have acquired the proper training, unless they are adhering to proper regulations that they update uh, that they keep that gun in a safe, all of the all of the attributes that make it in a sense a privilege and not a right. The same as <coughs> right is a privilege and not a right. You must be licensed in this country. Um, so I would say that this is misrepresenting what our issue is. It says we have objected to tightening legislation and access to firearms. <laughs> this is a strange way to put it. In fact, what we objected to was an attempt to make it impossible to own a gun for the purpose of self-defense. Um, uh, so again, these are technical, but this, this, this is a very serious, I mean, as you saw, this includes a silk, this includes uh, uh, one of South Africa's greatest uh, civil rights activists who was knighted in the UK. I thought they could have maybe been clear and technical in how they criticized us. But if we could please, my final reference will just be to where they say we have an elite agenda or or something to So, Mr. Oppenheimer, give me one second. Look to that. You have to go. I'll stay on my passport. Sorry. It's okay. I'll pass my passport. Okay. Okay. So, I'll, I'll stay up until you pass my place. Okay. That's fine. <coughs> Yeah, so that these issues reflect the concerns of the, of the board of an institute which nearly three decades after the end of the apartheid remains engaged primarily, primarily with the interests of an overwhelmingly white elite and big business constituency. The impression that has been created by these critics of us is that if you want ordinary South Africans to be able to defend themselves, under conditions of having acquired a license and maintaining what needs to be maintained. If you uh, think that the state should protect people from theft rather than engage in expropriation without compensation. If you believe that uh, South Africa's 80% preference for vouchers over race-based appointments should translate into uh, the law and that such a translation would actually boost opportunities for most people, most of whom are black. If you think all of those things, then you are a white elitist. I think that is an unfair distortion. Uh, it is attributing to us a motivation which is firstly not a motivation that we have. 
and secondly, not a motivation that you can even logically infer from our, our activities. If our activities were to serve an elite white interest, um, I think we would uh, have major sponsors that give us tens of millions of rands uh, to give us access to back channeling. Uh, uh, I, I think we should I mean. move on that. The witness testified on that and made it very clear <laughs> as to their structure of fine funding. Yes. I don't think there was anything unclear as to their funding structures. Yes. I, I should just say about our funding that since I joined, we, uh, to make up for these big corporates that left us because we wouldn't do what they said, uh, most of our funds now come from crowdfunding, where I think the average donation is something like 80 rand. So it's not rich people, it's people giving us 80 rand a month, and that's what keeps us going. And it's a, it's a very diverse group of people, although uh, I would say most of them are, are not richer than middle class. In fact, many are poor. Is your understanding of Mr. Ritz's evidence that he said that no dispossessions of land took place? No. My Lord, then I have uh, no further questions. Um, that would then conclude the evidence to be led by the complainant. Thank you very much. Mr. Klaus, at the beginning of uh, cross-examination, there's a bit of a debate between you and council about the uh, dispossession of land. And there's a whole debate about the, the use of the word land and the use of the word native. And he proposed to you that this dates back to 1652. Now, I know for quite some time he tried to say it as a general proposition. Just, just clarify me, as I understand, you accept that from 1652, people who were already occupying the land, and, and we all know that uh, during those times, people who were occupying the land were not occupying it on the basis of the legal system we have, where you would hold a title deed. People owned the land across where they would graze, where they would plow, where they would fetch water, all those kind of uh, things. So am I correct to say, I understand you to accept, if one formulated in that way, that all those people who were on the land when the Europeans arrived in South Africa in 1652 and going on, were actually forcefully removed from wherever they were. Um, no, my position is that I don't accept that because some, uh, because of the, the very heterogeneous nature of things. I don't want to be uh, seen to be trying to downplay it by saying, well, some kept their land. It's just to say that it is more complicated. Of course, for example, until you know, Paul Kruger was doing deals with the Buffer King, uh, uh, until the end of the Ninth Kosa War, after Nord and the and the millenarian movement there, uh, much of what we now consider to be the Eastern Cape uh, was uh, independent of the British Empire. Uh, KwaZulu Natal, uh, much of that only uh, fell under the British Empire after Isabuana uh, and King Ketuayo uh, um, basically being deposed. And even still, there were pockets of retention. So, in other words, by the time the country is unified in 1910 and the Land Act is passed in 1913. Part of how those boundaries were drawn uh, was to keep 
uh, some black people who had held onto their land in a customary form of ownership to keep them there and to force others to join them there in, a, in an unjust and uh, unsustainable fashion which made a bad situation worse. It's just, it would be historically inaccurate, I believe, to, to say that all had been dispossessed. It, it would make it impossible to understand what Saul Pike is going about when he writes about native life in South Africa in 1914. I, I, I didn't understand the argument to be say every single person who lived in South Africa from 1652 was forcefully removed. And you are correct, the, the Ngausa's uh, case history is slightly different from how they tackled it. And it's got its own context. We know what happened with the Eastern Cape, the Kosa people, how they resisted the tax and all those things, and how the British also tried to develop a strategy to deal with them. And as I understand, the Ngausa story comes in there. to say, because these people would move, we say, if you pay tax, they move to another area and they continue with their farming or their cattle heading. The Pukeng area is also slightly different. The dynamics there are very different. And we know, incidentally, as I understand, the Pukeng area, it's much larger than we look at it today. Yes. And in fact, if you read the history of Bafukeng, it stretches almost to my area, Kruger's yes. It takes the whole of Mahalis Beck. Yes. It takes right up to the other side of Rustenburg. So it's a huge land. Yes. Now, if somebody says people were not removed, now, the question would be, what happened to that land? How was that land then Gabafukin, people are no longer owning that land? Was the negotiation, because as I understand, at some point, the Bafukin king was quite a creative person, where people would go and work in Kimberley, come month and they come carrying money, they donate it into the pocket, to the basket, and then land is purchased. Yeah. But even that land, particularly the land in Mahalisbek, that land was purchased. Yeah. But they don't own it today, do they? Uh, 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 for a lot of that land, that is true. For some of that land, uh, there was a retention that had been held, much like in the case of the Kutudeni that I discussed earlier, through uh, basically by using a church. As a, as a mechanism to hold the land in so-called white South Africa yes. and then to have it returned, which is part of how the Buffalo King have, have maintained some of the land that they have today. But I, the, I, I, really am, I really would not want this court to have the impression that I'm trying to downplay the dispossession or to, or to downplay the fact that much of the dispossession, although far from all of it, was white people dispossessing black people. I was just trying to make it clear, and it can uh, maybe seem overly fastidious, but to my mind it's important, to make it clear that, um, that, the, that the story is heterogeneous, that there are, in different areas, there are different histories. And part of the reason that I believe that is important is that, and where it is relevant to what I was being asked about, was insofar as there is a myth, or a historical myth, uh, that was being criticized, a historical myth that underlies the policy of expropriation without compensation, um, I think that myth can only take root if one begins with an all or nothing view. I think already if one begins with a complicated view, even if it's a most and some kind of thing, it, it, that technical basis will, I think, establish the, the right route to thinking uh, for how we can resolve this problem under our legal system. But we could move to the later part of the history starting from the 1913 where the whole process of dispossessing the land was now institutionalized into a form of legislation. I'm, I'm sure you will accept that in as far as that's concerned, one can actually be specific of the areas where people were moved. And, and you can then generalize. I think that's what council was trying to say to you. If you generalize, 
you actually can come to the conclusion that yes, indeed, people were moved, people were forcefully moved. Um, there are some areas where there were engagement and negotiations between those in authority and the people who were occupied, and some of them would give in and say, we're going to move. We don't want to engage in this process. In fact, the area in mind, it's Manzeville, part of Manzeville. People move, there are certain people who get moved voluntarily when they were told. You've got to leave because you are too close to Kruger's door. And some people then resisted, and that's why you still have the old Manzeville today. Um, Just to be clear on that, my lord, uh, we at the Institute of Race Relations have consistently and still do actively campaign uh, for land restitution. Uh, we're direct dispossession as conceived of under our constitution. And, and so your point about, you said the ANC policy is based on the flawed history of dispossession. That statement comes from the fact that you say, as I understand, you say they generalize as though everybody else was moved. That is part of the that is part of the false premise. Another part of the false premise is that just in case one has some land over which one has some control, then prosperity is guaranteed. To me, that is a badly false premise. Uh, my analysis of agriculture in South Africa, although it is only two or three percent of our GDP, is that in order to be commercially viable, not always, but very, very often, you need a title deed so that you have collateral, so that you can get cheap access to credit, so that you can get the seeds, the equipment, and so on to farm fruitfully. Okay. If you undermine the title deed system, you undermine the banking system, you undermine that thing. So the, the phrase is the land is not about the land. Uh, you need more than land. You need land and a secure property rights system. And in my mind, that the ANC's policy would only be ready to undermine that property rights system if it thinks just in case people can have a piece of land, they will be fine. But I've spoken to many rural people who, who complain bitterly about their fruitless land because they rely on, on grants and the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform uh, to, to, to operate, and, and they cannot operate. Can I just also understand the issue of the campaign? Um, you saying that racism is not the problem, and I don't want us to go into the semantics of there and they. Let's keep to, is it a problem, is it not a problem? You saying it's not a problem in as far as land is concerned. I don't want us to go beyond outside the issue that's so linked to the real issue that has brought us here which is the singing of the song, and the song is related to occupation of the land. Now, you say it is not a problem. What does that mean I couldn't follow? Okay. With regards to land in South Africa, there is a race problem when land restitution has not taken place, where black people were dispossessed under the apartheid government or the government from Water and Smuts, through to Smuts again. Where people were dispossessed, they must be made whole. They can choose, as I understand it, to be paid in kind or to pursue a process where they actually get that land. That must happen. That process has stalled, and that is a problem. And it is a problem you can't extract from, from race because its origins are so clearly in race. Uh, so in that regard, there is a pertinent racial issue. Um, if I were to say more broadly, is that, the, is that the biggest problem with land reform in South Africa? I would say not. I would refer uh, my lord to the constitutional court judgment um, with regard to Hilton College and others in which a special master was appointed to preside over um, the migrant labor aspect of land reform because it was found that the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform had not been administering that process well. It is a damning judgment of a case that I personally researched. I interviewed the relevant parties on Hilton. There is an example 
amongst others where the thing that is getting in the way of the solution, and I can also refer this course to the Kakema Matanti report, uh, where some would say that the constitution is what's getting in the way. Uh, it found that the constitution was not the problem. Uh, and insofar as the constitution defends non-racialism, and some people say non-racialism is the problem, I would say non-racialism is not the problem, it's the solution. In short, we have found in all of our surveys that most South Africans agree with the following statement, and it's in the, it's in the dis dis documents. Uh, most South Africans agree, politicians use talk of race, racism and colonialism to excuse their own failures. I submit that that is a true statement, and that most South Africans agree with that statement. And that when it comes to land reform, it is more obvious than anywhere else that the obstacle to us doing better is not a, a handful of white people who hate black people. It's not even a, it's, it's not a handful of black people who hate white people. It is, a, it, is a, it is a political impasse which is not really about race. It's actually about corruption. And uh, maladministration, and that if we could solve that problem, then uh, most South Africans would be in a materially better position. And even though most South Africans already say that race relations are in a relatively good space, even more would say that as well. So, it would improve race relations and improve material conditions if we solve the problem in the word of corruption. Well, Let's take it a little bit back with the introduction of the restitution of land. When that program started, I'm sure the statement that you say politicians can be blamed, at that time, I would assume the majority of your black people who were fighting for, for restitution wouldn't see the problem as being caused by the politicians. But they would see the problem as what people who are occupying the land as the ones that are depriving them of the land. And, and what comes to mind here is, if you look at the time it took to get even a government institution like uh, the Kruger National Park Board to accept where there was clear evidence of people living in certain portions of Kruger National Park where there were artifacts that were there. And then the perception of the people was, it's these white people that are resisting us from occupying the land. So I, I want to understand when you say racism, it seems to me, my understanding, of, and it seems to be the evidence of Mr. Roth also, that to some extent it's propelled by statements made by politicians but does that suggest the ordinary people on the ground, and I'm talking about people in the rural areas who want the land back, would not see the problem as being, we denied our land because of the practice of racism? I think it's certainly the case that some people in urban areas and in rural areas see the obstacle to a better South Africa as being that white people are denying them access to that. It is clear that some people think that way. If I were to date myself back to the 1990s and the 2000s, my expert opinion would be stretched because I don't have survey data about what people thought back then. We were not doing regular surveys then. We, only, we did a survey in 20, 2007, then we did regular surveys from 2013. It's only at that point that I can say with some confidence, what are we seeing in what we're being told in these surveys? And of course, in every instance, out of 100 people, you know, maybe 80 think this way and 20 think that way, but you won't find 100 people who think the same. Um, I think it's a serious concern uh, that some people uh, might think that the fact that a white person owns property and they don't have property 
means that all white people are somehow uh, less than. I think it would be better uh, to, to find a route if that person should be restituted. Then the white skin of that owner is not going to be an obstacle to that restitution. If there is an obstacle, it will be that the poor person is not being legally supported or ushered through the process. It's process. the system itself. The system itself. Okay. And it is in that sense that we do try to redirect uh, tension and anger. Um, Okay, now tell me, in your surveys, have you done any survey about the choice between compensation and restitution? We have not asked people what they prefer. We have relied on uh, reports from uh, officials in government uh, to indicate what it is that people prefer. And, and no, any knowledge about what those officials would have said? So we remember when uh, it became a major talking point that the government has admitted 90% of people would rather have uh, financial compensation than the land. But we also noticed that that claim sometimes was over, was not sensitive to the distinction between land cases for the purpose of agriculture and land cases for the purpose of suburban dwelling. Yes. Um, I heard in court last week some attempt to inquire as to whether there is more granular data at a rural level. What are people really preferring? Um, I don't have a statistical backing uh, or basis to okay. answer that question. That's I can fine. say Thanks. from the maybe six months that I've spent in the field uh, asking people questions, that there is, a, that there is some appetite for uh, for farming and that there are successful black commercial farmers and that there are aspirational black commercial farmers and that uh, in all of the instances where I have seen success and sometimes the success has gone from very difficult to quite impressive success in all of those instances it has been backed by a title and in none of those instances has it been backed by a government command and control system. Okay. I think you've explained the singing of the song by Mr. Ndlozi, the Farmers Weekly Report. Um, there was something I wanted to ask here, the distance between Senegal and Hesoville. Thank you very much. Any question arising from my questions? Uh, no, my Lord. Thank you. Uh, is, there, is it possible for me to add one thing, just on the basis of what my Lord said? Yes. Um, with reference to America's idea of free speech and critical theory, that particular aspect, um, I have uh, had very many, I've had many conversations since I was called with my colleagues at the Institute of Race Relations. And I think it would be honest and fair for me to say that many of my colleagues are critical of Bakuda and of table of hate speech legislation and even would prefer our constitution not to be as it is, but rather to be as it is in America. That is not to say we have an institutional position on it. It's just to say we have some disagreement. And I have not talked about that because I'm not an expert in that and I leave it to you. But I don't, as a representative of the Institute of Race Relations, want anything I say to be uh, interpreted one way or another as, as what our view is on what hate speech is. I really don't have a view on that. I find it very confusing, even uh, as you were saying in your, in your, in your conversation with the council, when you were talking about that particular issue. It, 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 it's not where my knowledge is solved. Yeah. Well, my point was about the critical legal school. Um, the approach they have adopted in dealing with the concept of liberal how the liberals look at the state intervention and why things should be left to a liberal scholar says, leave everything to the individual. Yes. It's more individualistic, but it's a debate for another day. Yes. I'm not sure in the context of South Africa, I would still have to look at how you can match the American experience and the South African experience. They seem to be 
world apart. Uh, some of the problems that we have uh, can't really compare with America. There are certain lessons I don't want to be sound like uh, Americans have nothing to offer. But in terms of what we're dealing with, there seems to be a vast difference. I agree, and, and I, I, I just was raising this to say okay. that Thank you. It's, I, it's, it's not the same. Thank you very much. Mr. Kasiboto, any questions from you from my engagement with the witness? No. No. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kraus. You are excused. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Mr. Oppenheimer. My Lord, as I say, that is the uh, last witness for the complainant, and so the complainant uh, closes its case. And I gather that my learned friend will be leaving evidence uh, for the rest of the week. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kasibot, are you going to lead how many witnesses just should sleep over tonight, two witnesses, and they'll take tomorrow and Thursday? Um, I'll try and get my expert witness, so I'll have a lay witness, and, and everyone's just waiting for me to name this lay witness. I'll first have a lay witness, and then I'll have an expert witness in the morning, um, probably for three, four hours, and then if there's ample time, I'll then call the expert witness Yes, you didn't inform me who your lay witness is, but you informed the media because I saw in the media <laughs> they know the name before the judge knows the name. <laughs> That's how things work in South Africa. <laughs> uh, now, just uh, on a lighter note. Now, thank you very much. We're going to adjourn until tomorrow at, uh, we'll convene at 10 o'clock. The court shall adjourn. <clears throat>